Take the floor, Randy Weingarten. Can you hear me? So it's not often that you have actually scheduled something months and months in advance, and then all of a sudden it becomes the topic of the day because the Attorney General and the Secretary of Education release a report on the very same day on the very same topic. So this is now, um, so, so we actually have more folks at this um, panel, this Shanker panel, than we've had all year long at these um, monthly luncheons. But this is exactly what we've intended these Shanker panels to be. It's some topic that's really, that's on the minds, we hope, not just on policy wonks in Washington, D.C., um, but on the minds of educators and parents and students and the larger community in some ways, the way Bernie just talked so personally about what the effect of, you know, this kind of uh, so many suspensions, particularly on um, African American and Latino sons have meant in terms of schools throughout the country. So it's really trying to marry the policy wonks and the field together to have a real conversation about these kind of issues, about issues of, of real concern. And that's what these Shanker seminars have been about. So to all of you who are here today because you think you're going to have the response from the union to what um, the um, department and what the AG said, yes, you'll have that response, but frankly, it is much more important to have these kind of seminars and these ongoing conversations about long-term what we need to do. Um, and so, and so I love this. When, when Keith says to me, that's right, I know I'm going in the right direction. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the stories today and the report that the, um, that the federal government put out today is, reminds me of two things. Um, one, it, in some ways, it's the same searing debate that some of our cities are now having on stop and frisk, where there's a sense of, well, stop and frisk was really important for safety. Really? When Essentially, you're seeing that every or virtually every single, um, you know, black and brown teenager is stopped and whites are not. And what does that say to a community? You're saying that you can't actually um, honor constitutional rights and also ensure that a community is safe? And I think that's what's happened with zero tolerance in schools. It started as attempting to say, look, we absolutely have to have safe, secure, orderly schools. But what has happened is that it has become the only response to anything that's about any infraction. And I think the statistics that have been, that were released by the federal government today made that abundantly clear that what has happened as a result is that it has had this terrible impact on black and brown children, particularly black and brown young men. And so the question is, what do we do about it? That's the question right now. And I would like to spend um, most the rest of my time talking about that. Now, one of the things I think we do about it is that we have to actually look at what the Advancement Project have said about this actually all the way back in 2010. The Advancement Project actually called out the fixation on testing as a key driver to this school to prison pipeline or to this situation and 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 Keith and my and my um, colleague here from the department will talk also about the statistics and the effects 
I know probably we should have reversed it in terms of what to do about it, but the, what, what they said, and let me just quote their study, their 2010 report said, called Test, Punish, and Push Out, How Zero Tolerance and High Stakes Testing Funnel Youth into the School-to-Prison Pipeline, says that instead of supporting students who are struggling or in need, high stakes testing and zero tolerance policies needlessly punish young people and limit their opportunities to fulfill their potential to achieve their goals. And you can see why that happens, that as the budget cuts have happened throughout the United States of America, therefore, you know, um, extracurricular activities, art, music, guidance counselors, nurses, as they have all been pretty much diminished or axed. The things that still have gotten funding are test prep, testing, math courses, English courses, sometimes double and triple math courses and English courses, all with a sense of you got to do really well on testing. And so, and the other things that have gotten axed out are things like programs like restorative justice or some of the programs that address social, emotional, and other kinds of issues. So it creates this incredibly alienating environment that if you need to find a way to really hold somebody close and find some ways of intervening, those resources and supports are not there. And in, in some ways, what zero tolerance did, and this is the only warning across the bow that I would actually ask you to consider, is that Zero tolerance did what No Child Left Behind did, which is saying, we have a problem, we have a problem, we have a problem, and the way we're going to solve it is through sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. And we got to break that cycle. Even with now, we see that there's a problem. We have to move away from zero tolerance. And those who haven't, I think, after, and I'm glad to say that my union has, has moved away from it over the course of the last year or so anyway with the work that we've done with Atlantic Philanthropies and whatnot. But what we can't do is we are not going to sanction our way to success in schooling. So having said that, let me just end by saying these are, we've, we've spent a lot of time doing some work in some of our locals about how do you, even in these tough economic times, create um, a support net, uh, intervention net, a safety net, where you actually are keeping kids in schools and you're creating a safe, respectful environment for everyone in schools, kids and educators alike, where kids can thrive, particularly at-risk kids. And so these are the things that we would suggest you do, some of which um, were in the... Um, in the uh, um, report that, sec that Attorney General Holder and Secretary Duncan released today. But these are the things that we would suggest. Number one, ongoing professional development and training. Obviously aligned with school and district reform goals, but what's really important is we have to make sure that teachers and other educators have the tools so that they know how to engage in conflict resolution culturally, cultural relevancy and responsiveness, behavior management, social justice, and the kind of positive school discipline, school climate role that they need to do. Behavior management is probably the hardest thing for teachers to be able to do. And we need to spend the time helping them learn how to do this with real, real, real um, um, confidence so that they don't get, so that they engage, that, so that they can actually um, do what they need to do to keep kids in their classrooms and in schools. The other things are things that people know about already. Um, so, um, things like um, restorative justice programs. Um, so that is one of the things that I find to be one of the most um, interesting examples of some new work that people have done. Um, it's based on, for people who don't know, it's based on a concept that a person who has committed a wrong has a responsibility re to repair the harm he or she has done, both to the individuals who have been wronged and to the school community. 
And so what you see is that all the individuals who are involved in an incident then become part of a decision-making process that determines what took place through dialogue, problem solving, and what must be done to repair the harm. It's really a matter of really having kids, as well as the adults, engaged in how to solve a situation. And the focus of restorative justice is collaborative rather than adversarial, and it focuses on relationships rather than rules. Other things people have seen before, like peer mediation, we've had that in schools for a long time, but we need the resources to do it. The other kind of resource issues are obvious. Guidance counselors, um, enrichment programs, after school programs, um, uh, um, and audience very much about them. But when you have a combination of these kind of adult resources and peer mediation, see what you've seen in Baltimore, where you announced this today. You've seen what you see in Minnesota, where you have been able, where we've been able to cut suspensions and behavioral controls um, significantly. In Minnesota, they were cut by half. In Baltimore, I think. Um, Last two things I'll talk about. Community schools. This is something we've talked about a lot. We're a big, 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 what, I'm not speaking loud enough? Just a little bit. Sorry. When you have these kind of organic links to communities in which, you know, like we see in, um, in places like Cincinnati, where you also, where you have the kind of resources around the school that communities have wanted and really need, and that communities are in schools. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Maybe. How about now? Can you hear me now? Um, services such as not just social workers, not just medical providers, but adult job training and placement programs, legal counseling, drug counseling, um, housing counseling, like I've seen in Syracuse, helping to navigate the public agencies. Part of what we need to do is help when kids stumble or when anyone stumbles, how are we going to help navigate to success so that kids have the tools they need to navigate to their own success. So if we try to restore some of the budget cuts that have taken out the safety net, if we actually um, um, have supports, not just sanctions, and if we actually move away from, um, from zero tolerance and suspend or expel as a last resort only, only, only in the most egregious cases, as the federal government has now suggested, then we can actually say a year or two from now that we have done something significant to actually help keep kids in school. Again, let's stop the test fixation. Let's have a fixation on the whole child. And let's really pay attention to the supports that our most at-risk children need. Thank you very much.